Hello friends, welcome to EPG Fartshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shodungi. I teach English at Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata, West Bengal. Friends, we are into module 7, the title of the module Middle English Period under which Middle English Romances. This module is prepared by Dr. Mohua Bhoumik, who teaches English at Derosio College, Kolkata. Friends, in this module, we are going to learn the of Middle English Romances and it will point out the differences of Middle English Romances out of the Old English Heroic Poetry and it also deals with salient features of the former. It also speaks about the formation and categories of in Middle English Romances. We will also discuss at length the origin of Middle English Romances, growth of Middle English Romances and different categories under different heads. Friends, the shift from Old English heroic poetry to medieval verse romance marks a remarkable transformation in temperament. While the heroic poetry is realistic, romances is escapist in nature, where characters fight either on principles or of a, a ritual or the primary emphasis is on the hero's character. Customarily, the word romance is integratedly related to love story and since there are certain famous medieval romances involving palpable love elements like those of the Flores and the Bulge Floor, Lancelot and the Guever, it is assumed that medieval romances which always evolve certain love interests. However, if we ponder over romances of Alexander or Richard the Lionhearted, we will have difficulty to understand that most of the medieval romances have no love element whatsoever. So, romances during the Middle English period has an origin of love interest or the Arthurian legends in special. Friends, if you look in the first slide, there are two side by side books given that is Middle English Romances and the Specimens Early English Material Metrical Romances. Now, with the origin of romances up to the definition, let us talk about some features of romances. Primary material of medieval romances, romances are adventure of chivalrous knights. That means, these are adventure stories. Number two, imaginary narratives. These narratives are never factual, they are imaginary. They, they evolve out of adventures both in prose and verse. That means, by category, they are prose as well as verse narratives. Number three, Earlier romances composed in verse, prose romances came in letter. Marked by the lack of unity of action and less defined characters, that means if you think of characterization as specific in grand scale, you will not be successful. Characters are types, that means type creation is one of the features of these romances. They conform to a definite pattern, not much scope for making the characters as individual or living. Initially, the romances are used to cater to the test of the aristocratic upper class. That means, at the first instance, it was written for the upper class. French romances were immensely popular in England. As soon as the militaristic invasion was complete, it was handed down to the British. English romances came into existence only when English ousted French as the courtly language of England. It was a later development. Most of the English romances belong to the 14th century and are mostly translations or adaptations from the French counterparts. Friends, now let us talk about the divisions of 
or categories of romances that we have. Medieval romances are divided into three broad heads. Number one, matter of France. Number two, matter of Britain. And number three, matter of Rome. Another matter which is included later is matter of England. Friends, first let us talk about matter of France. Some of the important romances belonging to this particular tradition, that means matter of France are number one, the Sudan of Babylon, number two, Sir Ferubras, number three, Otwell, number four, Duke Rowland and Sir Atuel, Spiny Atuel, Spiny. Num next, Atuel and Ronal. Next, Roland and Varangu. Next, the Seas of Malayne. Friends, after the matter of France, let us switch over to matter of Britain. Some of the important works belonging to the matter of Britain are number one, Arthur and Maureen. Possibly this is the by far the best under this category. Sir Gawain and Green Knight, most celebrated French and romance under Britain is Sir Gawain and Green Knight. Awain and Gawain, Lancelot of Lake, Mort Arthur. Sir Tristan, Sir Percival of Gales. All these matters belonging to Britain are marked by sweet cadence and easy flow of language. Friends, next comes the matter of Rome. Some of the important works belonging to the matter of Rome are number one, King Alexander. Fragment of Alexander A, Fragment of Alexander B, Seas of Thebes. You are all familiar with Thebes, which has been described in Oedipus. Now, matter of England. The matter of England is also exhibited through the corpus of romances. Number one, Havelock the Dam. Number two, King Horn. Number three, Guy of Warwick. Number four, Bavis of Hampton. Number five, Richard Cowher de Lyon. So, all this belong to matter of England. So, in this particular module, friends, you have been exposed into different categories, origin and different categories of romances. We have also had some examples from different categories. Our mission of this module was to familiarize with you the different ide ideas related to romances. We have pointed out how romances evolved, definition of romances, categories of romances, characteristics of romances with examples under different heads. Friends, storyboard, do not go home without looking at the word. There are some useful audio visual links waiting for you. Here are they. Hi there, my name is John Green, this is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk about Jesus. So this is a Roman coin from around the time Jesus was born in the Roman Empire, and it calls Augustus the Emperor the Son of God. So let's just state at the outset that in 4 BCE, being the Son of God, or at least being the Son of a God, was not such an unusual thing. But a poor Jew being the Son of God, that was news. <laughs> Thank you.
any understanding of Christianity has to start with Judaism because Jesus was born a Jew and he grew up in the Jewish tradition. He was one of many teachers spreading his ideas in the Roman province of Judea at the time, and he was part of a messianic tradition that helps us understand why he was thought of not only as a teacher, but as something much, much more. Let's go straight to the thought bubble today. The people who would become the Jews were just one of many tribal peoples eking out an existence in that not very fertile crescent world of Mesopotamia after the agricultural revolution. The Hebrews initially worshipped many gods, making sacrifices to them in order to bring good weather and good fortune, but they eventually developed a religion centered around an idea that would become key to the other great Western religions. This was monotheism, the idea that there is only one true god, or at least that if there are other gods, they're total lameoids. The Hebrews developed a second concept that is key to their religion as well, the idea of the covenant, a deal with God. The main man in this, the big mocker, was Abraham. Not to make this too much of a scripture lesson, but it's kind of hard to understand the Jews without understanding Abraham, or Abram as he was known before he had his big conversation with God recorded in Genesis 17. When Abram was ninety years and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I'm gonna make a covenant with you and a bunch of cool things will happen, like you're gonna have kids and your descendants will number the stars and you can have all the land of Canaan forever, it's gonna be awesome. I'm paraphrasing by the way, Thought Bubble. So God promised that Abram would have kids with his wife, even though the dude was already like 99, but there was a catch. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. Keep it PG-13, Thought Bubble. Now that is asking a lot from a guy, especially a 99-year-old geezer like Abram living in a time before general anesthesia. But those were the terms of the deal, and in exchange, God had chosen Abraham and his descendants to be a great nation. From this, we get the expression that the Jews are the chosen people. Thanks for keeping it clean, Thought Bubble. So some important things about this God. One, singularity. He, and I'm using the masculine pronoun because that's what Hebrew prayers use, does not want you to put any gods before him. He is also transcendent, having always existed, and he is deeply personal. He chats with prophets, sends locusts, etc. But he doesn't take corporeal form like Greek and Roman gods do. He is also involved in history, like he will destroy cities and bring floods and determine the outcome of wars and possibly football games. Stan, no, football games! Probably most important to us today, and certainly most important to Jesus, this God demands moral righteousness and social justice. So this is the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, and despite many ups and downs, the Jewish people have stuck with him for, according to the Hebrew calendar, at least over 5,700 years. And he has stuck by them too, despite the Jews being on occasion something of a disappointment to him, which leads to various miseries, and also to a tradition of prophets who speak for God and warn the people to get back on the right path, lest there be more miseries. Which brings us back to our friends, the Romans. By the time Jesus was born, the land of the Israelites had been absorbed into the Roman Empire as the province of Judea. At the time of Jesus' birth, Judea was under the control of Herod the Great, best known for building the massive temple in Jerusalem that the Romans would later destroy. And by the time Jesus died, an expanded Judea was under the rule of Herod Antipater, also, unhelpfully, known as Herod. Both Herods ultimately took their orders from the Romans, and they both show up on the list of rulers who were oppressive to the Jews, partly because there's never that much religious freedom in an empire. Unless you are, wait for it, the Mongols. Or the Persians. Also, they were Hellenizers, bringing in Greek theater and architecture and rationalism. And in response to those Hellenistic influences, there were a lot of preachers trying to get the Jews to return to the traditions and the godly ways of the past, including the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and the Zealots. And one of those preachers, who didn't fit comfortably into any of those four groups, was Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was a preacher who spread his message of peace, love, and above all, justice across Judea during his actually average length life for his time. He was remarkably charismatic, attracting a small but incredibly loyal group of followers, and he was said to perform miracles, although it's worth noting that miracles weren't terribly uncommon at the time. Jesus' message was particularly resonant to the poor and downtrodden, and pretty radical in its anti-authoritarian stance. He said it was easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. He said the meek were blessed, that the last would be first and the first would be last. All of which was kind of threatening to the powers that be, who, according accordingly had him arrested, tried, and then executed in the normal manner of killing rebels at that time, crucifixion. Also, just to put this question to bed, the Romans crucified Jesus because he was a threat to their authority. Later traditions saying that the Jews killed Jesus, very unfortunate, 
also very untrue. We're not going to discuss Jesus' divinity because one, this isn't a theology class, and two, flame wars on the internet make me so uncomfortable that I have to turn to camera two. Hi there, camera two. I'm here to remind you that three, fighting over such things, like fighting over whether the proverbial cake is a lie, rarely accomplishes anything. Plus, four, what matters to us is the historical fact that people at the time believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Anointed One the Son of God. And they believed that he would return someday to redeem the world. Which leads us to two questions about Christianity. First, why did this small group of people believe this? And second, why and how did that belief become so widespread? So why would people believe that Jesus was the Messiah? First, the Jews had a long tradition of believing that a savior would come to them in a time of trouble. And Judea under the rule of Herod and the Romans? Definitely a time of trouble. And many of the prophecies about this savior point to someone whose life looks a lot like Jesus's. For instance, Isaiah 53 says the person will be misunderstood and mistreated, just like Jesus was. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their face he was despised, and we didn't respect him. And a lot of the prophecies, like Daniel 7:14, for instance, explain that when the Messiah comes there will be this awesome new everlasting kingdom. And that had to sound pretty good to people who'd had their autonomy taken away from them. So some religious Jews saw Jesus in those prophecies and came to believe, either during his life or shortly thereafter, that he was the Messiah. Most of them thought the new everlasting kingdom was right around the corner, which is probably why no one bothered to write down much about the life of Jesus for several decades, by which time it was clear that we might have to wait a bit for this brilliant new everlasting kingdom. I should note, by the way, that the idea of a messiah was not unique to the Jews at the time. Even the Romans got in on the action. For instance, the Roman poet Virgil wrote of a boy who shall free the earth from never ceasing fear, he shall receive the life of gods, and see heroes with gods commingling. Sound familiar? But Virgil was writing about Emperor Augustus in that poem, not Jesus, which points again to the similarities between the two. Both called sons of God, both sent to free the earth from never ceasing fear, but one ruled the largest empire in the world, and the other believed that empire and the world needed to change dramatically. So why did the less wealthy and famous son of God become by far the more influential? Well, here are three possible historical reasons. Reason one, the Romans continued to make things bad for the Jews. In fact, things got much worse for the Jews, especially after they launched a revolt between 66 and 73 CE, which did not go well. By the time the dust had settled, the Romans had destroyed the temple and expelled the Jews from Judea, beginning what we now know as the Jewish diaspora. And without a temple or geographic unity, the Jews had to solidify what it meant to be a Jew and what the basic tenets of the religion were. This forced the followers of Jesus to make a decision. Were they going to continue to be Jews, following stricter laws set forth by rabbis, or were they going to be something else? The decision to open up their religion to non-Jews, people who weren't part of the covenant, is the central reason that Christianity could become a world religion instead of just a sect of Judaism. And it probably didn't hurt that the main proponent of sticking with Judaism was James, Jesus' brother, who was killed by the Romans. Reason number two is related to reason number one, and it's all about a dude named Saul. No, not that Saul. Yes. Saul of Tarsus, thank you. Saul, having received a vision on the road to Damascus, became Paul and began visiting and sending letters to Jesus followers throughout the Mediterranean. And it was Paul who emphatically declared that Jesus followers did not have to be Jews, that they didn't have to be circumcised or keep to Jewish laws or any of that stuff. This opened the floodgates for thousands of people to convert to this new religion. And the other thing to remember about Paul is that he was a Roman citizen, which meant he could travel freely throughout the Roman Empire. This allowed him to make his case to lots of different people and facilitated the geographic spread of Christianity. Oh, it's time for the open letter? All right. An open letter to the fish. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh, Stan, it's my favorite album, Jesus Christ Superstar, finally available in my favorite format, the cassette. Did I color coordinate my shirt to Jesus Christ Superstar? Yes. Dear Ichthys, so check this out. In the first century, when it was still super underground and hipster to be a Christian, you were a secret symbol of Christianity, used to kind of hide from the Romans. Ichthys, the Greek word for fish, was an acronym, and it was a super clever way to talk about religion without anyone knowing that you were talking about it. But you'll never guess what happened. Even in places where it's completely fine to talk about Christianity now and to use, you know, regular Christian symbols like the cross, you have had a huge resurgence thanks to the plastic automobile decal industry. I mean, seriously, Ichthys, I I haven't seen a comeback like this since Jesus. Best wishes, John Green. And lastly, Christianity was born and flourished in an empire with a common language that allowed for its spread. And crucially, it was also an empire in decline. Like, even by the end of the first century CE, Rome was on its way down. And for the average person, and even for some elites, things weren't as good as they had been. In fact, they were getting worse so fast that you might have thought the end of the world was coming. And Roman religion offered no promise of an afterlife and a bunch of squabbling, whiny gods. 
sorry if I offended adherents to Roman religion, but seriously, they squabble. So even though early Christians were persecuted by the Roman Empire and sometimes fed to the lions and other animals, the religion continued to grow, albeit slowly. But then as the Roman decline continued, Emperor Constantine allowed the worship of Jesus and then eventually converted to Christianity himself. And then the religion really took off. I mean, Rome wasn't what it used to be, but everybody still wanted to be like the emperor. And soon enough, there was a new son of God on coins. Thanks. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Historical Analysis Puppet Theater. Today on our program we take a journey backwards through time to hear an interview with prominent fictional historian Dr. Joanne Adams about an age of chivalry and knighthood. An age that immortalized the legendary character of King Arthur forever. And now, King Arthur and the Matter of Britain, an introduction. Good evening, Dr. Adams, and good evening, viewers. We are here today to discuss the historical phenomenon known as the Matter of Britain. Dr. Adams, could you please start by explaining to our viewers exactly what is meant by the term Matter of Britain? Certainly, and allow me to preface this by thanking you for inviting me to be on your show. The Matter of Britain is the umbrella name for the legendary history of Great Britain. King Arthur is, of course, the central figure of this history, along with his Knights of the Round Table. Two main aspects of the legend of King Arthur gave it particular success and were the focus of many later authors and scholars. First, the story of Camelot, and second, the story of the quest for the Holy Grail. What is it about the matter of Britain that makes it worthy of being discussed on this show? The term Britain is at the center of the issue what constitutes Britain as a location, and who, if anyone, has the right to hold the throne of such a place. As my colleague R. R. Davies points out in Island Mythologies, The idea of Britain exercised a powerful hold over the medieval mind. It had a depth, a resonance, a precision, and an incontestability which did not belong to its competitors, England, Scotland, Wales. Britain had long constituted a separate, definable world on its own. Early medieval writers were very much at home with the concept of Britain. It was the natural geographical framework for their histories. Does Davies write anything else about what the term Britain meant during the Middle Ages? Oh yes, Davies discusses the idea that a single Britain was... More than a convenient and historically redolent term, it was also a political aspiration. Not to mention... An ecclesiastical dream. Now, I've read some very interesting things about a gentleman known as Geoffrey of Monmouth and his volume, The History of the Kings of Britain. What can you tell us about this? Well, today's historians do not view Geoffrey's narratives as particularly historically accurate, and even some of his contemporaries regarded him as a bit of a scoundrel. But most of his contemporaries were completely taken with his stories, and this piece is an important work of medieval literature and one of the chief literary contributions to the matter of Britain. How far did its influences extend? Well, while the piece may not be historically accurate in and of itself, it did influence the course of history and was incorporated into many other works, despite widespread criticism. But the history of the Kings of Britain was not only a literary success, it also posed a political challenge, and Davies conveniently outlines the four major challenges inherent in the piece. He also specifies that they all center upon the challenge inherent in the concept of Britain. Please enumerate these challenges. Well, first of all, there was King Arthur. As Davies states, King Arthur became the paradigm of what truly great kingship could be. Measured by his standards, his modern successors turned out to be wimps. He was referred to as once lord of the monarchy of the whole of Britain, and was in fact more of a threat dead than alive. The prospect of his return to reclaim his inheritance and to be crowned as king in London was tied into the prophecies of Merlin. Which brings us to the second challenge, the prophecies of Merlin. Arthur, Merlin, and the word Britain were an eminently dangerous combination. They were a deadly threat to English supremacy since they predicated the return of Britain and the Britons to their former glory. The third challenge lies with the historian's conception of the political order. Geoffrey assumes through the piece that there was a single Britain ruled by a succession of single kings. He uses terms such as the island of one crown, the diadem of Britain, the kingship of the whole island. Davis does state, Geoffrey was too clever an artist to define closely what he meant in political terms by Britain. In particular, he was suitably ambiguous about Scotland. 
But Davies continues by emphasizing that this did not detract from the fact that his central political image was the single monarchy of Britain. The fourth challenge is that Geoffrey did not reach the Romans and the invasion of Julius Caesar, thus forging a link between the Anglo-Saxons and Romans of antiquity, until chapter 54 of his Historia. While other writers began their pieces with this event, Geoffrey included over a thousand years worth of British history and kings before this, all the way back to Brutus, great-grandson of Aeneas, and allegedly the first king of Britain. Modern historians can, of course, dismiss these notions as contrived, but Geoffrey's contemporaries could not. So, what does all this mean for England and for the concept of Britain? Well, I think that again, Davies puts it most articulately. In past-oriented and past-validating societies, control and exploitation of the past are critical to credibility in the present. Basically, this discontinuity between histories was awkward and dangerous. The issue that had to be negotiated is known as the passage of dominion. This refers to taking the history of Britain's past and connecting it to the saga of English victory, which would lead to a future restoration of an Arthurian monarchy of all of Britain. In other words, the English had to become the owners of the British past if their claim to Britain and the reinstitution of Arthur's monarchy was to be legitimized. And did Davies specify how they attempted to do this? Yes, he gives three examples. The first is the letter from Edward I to Pope Boniface VIII in May 1301, in which he explains his right as immediate and proper lord of the realm of Scotland. The letter begins with a certain valiant and illustrious man of the Trojan race called Brutus, and traversed the centuries until it came to Arthur, king of the Britons and the most renowned of princes. Edward explains further in this letter how Arthur conquered the Scots, and then later about how Alfred and his successors, who were no longer kings of Britain, but of England. Finally, Edward compiled several English sources to prove once and for all that he was entitled to lordship over Scotland as Arthur was before him. Wow, what's the second example? A pictorial genealogical history of the kings of Britain slash England, composed around the same time as Edward's letter, most likely at St. Mary's Abbey in York. It outlines the ancestry of Britain's monarchs in a web of medallions, as well as represents the kings of England and Scotland and their intermarriages throughout history. And the third example Davies provides? The third example is a manuscript found in the library at All Souls College, Oxford, which was compiled in the early 14th century, and which laid down a similar message to the other two artifacts. It included an unfinished copy of Geoffrey's Historia, a history of the English kings from Saxon times, a copy of Edward's letter to the Pope, notes on geographical dimensions and divisions of England, and a copy of the sections of Peter Langtoft's chronicle on Edward I's interactions with Scotland. The central idea to this volume is of a single Britain. However, Langtoft resentfully admits that the attempt to restore the Empire of Britain failed, due primarily to the existence of alternative mythologies, such as the Scotia story, that the English fell short of repressing. How very interesting! Was the problem ever solved? Well, Davies asserts that the final solution to what he calls the British problem was that everyone substituted the name Kingdom of the English for Kingdom of Britain. He emphasizes the idea of solving by eliminating. And Davies writes in conclusion, The triumph of this English definition of self-identity marked, in effect, the abandonment of a British ideology, and with it, the concept of a monarchy of the whole of Britain. When such ideas re-emerged in the 16th and 17th centuries and thereafter, it was on very different terms. Well, Dr. Adams, this has been quite an enlightening interview, but unfortunately we are out of time for today. Up next on Channel 17, Matt and Tori will apply the information discussed on our show today to Scotland's history and will converse about Scotland's reactions and responses to the legend of King Arthur. I hope you enjoyed this particular module. Thank you.